Welcome back to another episode of Extreme Metal Television. I am your host, Dr. Gore, and in this episode, we sit down to speak to North Carolina prog metalers between the buried and me. And we also have a chat with Edmonton metalers, Criticos. And at the end of the episode, we have a special tribute to Woodsy Prairie frontman David Gold, who sadly passed away in a car accident late last year. But why don't we get things going with a band profile? Reverend Kill was formed in 2004 in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. They have released three albums, their 2005 self-titled debut, 2008's His Blood, Our Victory, and their latest War and Conflict. The band is currently working on a new album. The new album that's coming out is quite diverse. It's not like really straight ahead heavy like the last one was. It's got quite a span to it of different kinds of styles. Well, how's it going to differ from the last record? Like, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like all three albums with just kind of some new styles of riffing and like you know new, new scales and stuff added in and you know just a couple of like you know and play there's a couple pretty heavy slow stuff some really fast stuff like you know the last album was pretty straight out fast right and this one's pretty all over the place like you know some stuff with good feeling to it some good headbanger groovy stuff. actually getting something hard out there do you still think it's worth it uh, now in this digital age to produce an actual hard copy of a CD or yeah. is it still For worth sure. it digital? when you tour man like I think when we're out touring and we play a show and everybody's hammered and they want to buy a CD right and then the money goes straight to us like we invest we get our money back like you know fuck I don't want no record company taking all my money I'd rather go play the shows and just meet everybody face to face right sell them a CD or give CDs away. Like, you know, we, we pretty much give our CDs away most of the time, right? So. Well, having dealt with a record label, uh, would you do that again, depending on the deal, or like, are you going to keep it independent this time and I, keep the money in your pocket? I think uh, in this day and age, like it's a pretty level playing field because of the internet, and uh, I'd rather just keep the money in my pocket. I don't really care if stars or not just like where we go if hopefully people like us coming there so we can come back right buy our cds and just keep on the note and make them out, right? how does the the creative process work with rev kill like when you're sitting so your your album's already written how do you get to that point when you're ready to record how does that whole creative process work for you guys well, like we kind of each write our own songs and we write like each of the guitar lines and bass, the bass line. Like we try and present the entire song that's in our mind to each other, right? And then uh, we each learn each other's stuff. Do you understand what I mean? Like, and it's like, you know, so we sit down like and record it because like we all got little home studios so we can pretty much put the drums in the way we got it in our head and then we can kind of actually get the tune out the way we are instead of trying to like me come up with a riff and him come up with a riff we try to put it all together we don't do that I mean, like, we each write our own songs and present them to the rest of the band and we work as a band together to play each other's music like you know just like we're supposed to I think. <laughs> Last year, we caught up with Dan Briggs and Tommy Rogers from Between the Buried and Me. We spoke about the band's latest EP, The Hypersleep Parallax Dialogues. Now that's part one of a multi-album concept. So we asked the band what this introduction to the story was all about. It's basically an introduction to two characters that live on two separate planets and two separate galaxies. And they're related in a lot of ways we haven't explained yet. And um, it, it basically just deals with their life decisions and they're both kind of on their own separate journey kind of towards each other. And um, it's pretty vague as of now, but um, we're, we're definitely going to open it up a lot. I know that sounds just like nothing. A lot of traveling through space and time. A lot of traveling through, yeah, exactly. This is real life stuff. <laughs> 
But it's basically an introduction to these two characters and, you know, most of, the, most of the record it's them dealing with being alone and being in seclusion away from everybody and, you know, their minds are kind of driving them crazy and making them think, think things that aren't and they're kind of, they're having dreams, they're having the same dreams and they have a lot of connections that they don't, they don't even know each other exists yet, but there's, there's lots of connections between the two that will be discovered later. When writing a concept album, I want to know if it started with an endpoint in mind or does the story we evolve as you as a We kinda had an endpoint, but um I think we want to get a little more creative with it. Yeah. I don't think it's ready. Um, but this is the first time we've ever done this, so it's, it's something new, especially for me. Um, I've never had to stay within a storyline within writing lyrics, and it's, it's weird. It was very hard to you know, not drift off and write about something else, because you know? no matter each song has something separate. So what comes first then? Is it the music dictates where the story's gonna go, or does the story dictate the music? I think this time the story was there first. Yeah, yeah we had the story idea together. Um, we normally write the music before the lyrics are done, and that's kind of how I like it, just because I, I want to always make sure the lyrics feel right with what's going on in the song at that time. You know, because the songs are very, you know, there's lots of climaxes and there's slow parts, and I, I don't want, I want the lyrics to fit. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you would write a movie score, you, you don't want it to be out of place. And, um, yeah, so we try to get the music done, and then I uh, write a bunch of lyrics and hope it works out. <laughs> Between the Buried and Me's lyrical concepts are certainly quite complex, and so is their approach to progressive metal. The band takes the listener many different places all in one song. So we ask them, do they find it important to challenge themselves musically with each album? To me, that's kind of the basis of the whole band, yeah. you know? Um, is uh, just constantly having new places to go. And, uh, you know, we have, we have the freedom to do that. Thankfully, you know, the band's kind of been like that from day one, having a lot of different influences, and, and uh, now we're able to go all over the place yeah. through space and time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you guys recorded Parallax in Canada with uh, yes. David Balrel. Uh, How did you come about choosing him as a producer? He kind of came to us. Um, we, you know, we've been working with our buddy Jamie King pretty much since the beginning. And you know, when we started talking about possibly doing something new, it was a, a scary thing to kind of dive into. But uh, I don't know. We we met with David. Where was that? We met him. Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Randomly. Yeah, and we, you know, we, we seemed to click on a personal level and you know he, he was very interested in working with us and we he obviously has a lot of phenomenal records under his belt you know and we wanted to kind of have an outside perspective that we haven't had before and you know that was kind of the idea <laughs> This is Barney from Napalm Dead, singer of Sun Description, and you're watching Extreme Metal Television. Edmonton's Criticos have been making waves in the Alberta metal scene since 2009. We caught up with the band when we were in Edmonton and asked them the story behind their unique name. Well, I guess I'm responsible for that. Uh, Criticos came from a movie, uh, 13 Ghosts. It was inspired by the uh, the older film, but the name came from the newer film. I just thought it was pretty pretty rad. Cyrus Criticos was a ghost hunter that hunted ghosts specifically from the Black Zodiac to uh, power this uh, machine that was designed by the devil and powered by the dead. So I thought that was pretty fucking cool. <laughs> Uh, Criticos combines uh, a, a lot of different elements. There's death metal, there's thrash, there's a bunch of other things going on in there. Uh, how does that whole sound come together? Work and a lot of dedication, man, to fucking making metal. <laughs> you know, 
I know there's a lot of thrash and old school because I'm getting older and that was the era I grew up in. I love that stuff. Uh, Pantera, Slayer, you know, the big fours, Anthrax, Megadeth, you name it. They all uh, had big influences. And then guys like John here, you know, perfect guy to back that and throw the, throw the heaviness into it. Pretty Coast handled the recording of their debut album, Dead Angels, all by themselves. We asked them what that process was like. It was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, a lot of hours, a lot of uh, learning, a lot of uh, dedication, um, some fear. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of hours, a lot of time put into that. And uh, I think we're, we're fairly proud about uh, building that ourselves um, and looking towards uh, the future and bigger and better things in that regard. Hopefully with videos and, and albums and interviews and so on and so <laughs> forth, yeah. So no, you, you guys did record that album yourself, correct? Yeah. Uh, why, did, why did you choose to go that way instead of the, the studio route? Uh, we've spent money on uh, Pro Studios. We've witnessed it. So we got a pretty good understanding of how they were doing it inside. Plus we did a little bit of schooling for it. And we were like, let's save a buck and do it ourselves and make it exactly the way we want it. So overproducing or underproducing, and just getting it the way we wanted it and hopefully people would like it. Alright, that is going to do it for another episode of Extreme Metal Television. I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'd like to introduce my co-host, King, for the, our Woods of Be Prey tribute. Well, David was a really great musician, and we had the opportunity to interview him on uh, this show and Vinland Radio several times. He also shared the stage with David. Now, the first time I uh, even spoke to David was the second episode of Vinland Radio. I played a song off Woods 3, an as-yet-to-be-released song off Woods 3. It's on a compilation. I sent David an email saying, hey man, check it out. I have a new show and I played your band. And he wrote me back. He's like, that's great, but where the hell did you get that song? The album's not even finished yet. <laughs> so I sheepishly wrote back, oh, well, it was on a compilation. I hope you're not mad. He wrote back immediately saying, no, no, I'm just uh, happy someone's playing the album already. And then a surprise, surprise, a couple of weeks go by and a copy of Woods 3 shows up in the mail with a handwritten note from David and, uh, oddly enough, a guitar string. He, had enough, he usually uh, gave some little personal token when he sent out CDs and uh, records and stuff like that. Yeah, when I bought my Woods of Ypres 3 pack, he gave me, or he wrapped them all up in uh, old metal magazine. Yeah. <laughs> he was a great guy, uh, definitely did a lot for Canadian music and uh, we're really sad to see him go. There is going to be a tribute show here in Calgary on February 24th, I believe, and we're going to be covering that, so we'll have that coming up in a future episode. But right now, we're going to leave you with a little bit of a tribute to David Gold, uh, some outtakes and uh, some live stuff when we last spoke to him. All right, until next time, see ya. We are two Canadians, two Americans, the True Doom and Black Metal Band, Woods of Ypres. We begin with a song from our first record, 2002's Against the Seasons. Cold winter songs from the dead summer heat. This is the sea of immeasurable loss. Uh, what advice would you give to an, an up and coming independent band here to give one piece of advice? Um, it is impossible for me to kind of give advice for bands, and I'll explain what I mean. It's that for any band, for them to survive, they have to see where they fit into history. So there's a problem when there's a, maybe a new band that comes up and they might be 19 or 20 years old and they might come to me for advice. And my experience has been different from them because I, I existed in a different decade than they have in the music and things have changed. So when people ask for advice, I jokingly kind of say, yeah, like, don't do what we did, you know? And I mean, we've certainly had a rough go, but we've had some successes too. Um, but it's really hard to give advice for, for anybody the same way that it, it was always hard for us to, to take good advice from bands that were older than us because they lived in a different environment. Um, and things happen so fast these days. It's for a young band, they have to really look at their environment and um, 
and figure out what works for them. And it might they might have like a shorter cycle than we did. They might achieve success quicker than, than we did because something might be available to them that wasn't available to us. I think of us as kind of like one of the very few or one of the last kind of traditional bands in the sense that we had a year under our belts before the whole MySpace thing kicked in. So I, you know, I have a, a, a um, you know, a beer box somewhere that it's full of actual developed photos. You know, that we would like, I'd go to, we'd play a show and I'd buy a disposable camera and give it to somebody in the crowd who would take 20 pictures and I'd bring it to Blacks and get them developed for like a dollar each. You know what I mean? Back yeah. in the day. So we have that and we have that experience where everything was physical yeah. and we have those years where I was more concerned with mailing CDs all over the world than I was uh, eating, <laughs> you know? So, and now it's all different because people aren't really dealing with the mail so much anymore and we love the mail and we got so used to, you know, we have this, we have, still have this romance with, with putting things in the mail and sending them all over the world, you know? Um, but the advice thing is, is, uh, is really hard to do. I say the, the one thing that I would say for bands now is uh, take things one at a time. And by that I mean um, if you're going to put out um, one product, so like one CD or something, it'll be like put that out and promote it and at least make your money back before you get into anything else. But you got to spend more time. You know, it's, it's I, I understand it too. You're creative, you're a musician, you want to write. As soon as you write something and put it out, you're like, oh, I'm tired of this, I want to do something else. And there's some bands that are like, they already get started working on their second record before that first record's even out. And you really do need to take time to promote that first record for all kinds of reasons. One, to make your money back, but two, to kind of really work it and get it out there. You do need to make that time to do it, and then you can get working on your next piece of music. And I only say that because over the years, we've tried so many kind of wacky things to try to get things moving when we thought, nothing's happening for us it's everything's so slow going and it's so frustrating so we would just be kind of you know throwing ideas and promotions just kind of right and left and then i mean that's maybe the one thing that's kind of worked for us is that eventually it did work yeah. but it's been expensive it's been stressful it's been time consuming you know a lot of success but a lot of regrets too um and we took a lot of really big chances and i'm at least happy that we took that even that one very last big chance you know, I remember having a conversation with Evan last summer about like whether or not we should even do that tour at all. You know, and Evan, in the end, was talking me into it, saying, "You know, we got to go do it. We got to go take this chance." And then we did, and then we got signed. <laughs> you know, so there's just those kind of things. Um, you, you, how to say this? If you, if you want to have fun with music, best advice would be. You know, if you kind of you work at a day job and you do music on your own terms or whatever, um, you know, so you're not depending on and you don't have to get involved in the, the, the biz of it, you know. And uh, but you can't you can't do both. So for example, if you want to go full into the biz with it, you have to accept the biz for how it is. And there's things every day that are so hypocritical and so frustrating and whatever. But you just have to like accept that they're there and you flow with it. So and that's not to say that we're. We, we always feel compromised, but the, I guess the best way that I can explain it is this. You might see every year there's going to be some guy who's a you know, really good musician, intelligent guy, has worked hard all his life at his craft or, or what have you, um, you know, and who wanted to be successful. And he comes to a point where he says, music business is messed up, I'm out, I'm not doing it anymore. And he puts something like, here's how much I made this year or whatever, this is a joke and I can make more tomorrow in my band or whatever. And that guy makes a great point. But the thing is, in saying that, he's out of the game. So we realize all that kind of stuff, but we still want to stay in the game is the thing. So we still do it because we think that we'll have success if, you know, because we've got so much invested in it, we're, we're, we've come so far that we don't mind going a little bit further, yeah. you know. But of course, I mean, there's things that, yeah, man, you get ripped off all the time. Or we do this, this tour, some guy might approach us about booking a show, and, uh, you know, and the promoter doesn't even show up to the show. And, you know, what do you do? Well, you pack your stuff up, you go in the van, you move to the next city. Things happen all the time, yeah. you know. And at this point, all we do is laugh. It's just like <laughs> for every tour, something more ridiculous happens that we've never encountered before, and, and we get, we've just become better at dealing with it. This is David Gold from the True Doom and black metal band Woods of Ypres. I'm sorry, and you're watching? <laughs> Extreme Metal Television. Extreme Metal Television. Okay, let me do this. <laughs> Big Doom. <laughs> MTV. <laughs> this is David Gold from the True Doom and black metal band Woods of Ypres, and you're watching Extreme Music Television.
Metal? metal. Shit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alright, no, take three. Take three. <laughs> this is David Gold from the True Doom and black metal band Woods of Ypres, and you're watching Extreme Music Television. Metal. What did I say? Music? Yeah. Oh, shit. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real long day. I'll, I'll get it. Right, right. Sorry, dude. dude right. Oh, no. Don't put these, don't put these in here. Come on. Have mercy on me. Here we go. Come. This is David Gold from the True Doom and black metal band Woods of Ypres, and you're watching Extreme Metal Television. <laughs> 